I'd like to welcome everyone to the, what month is it? April of 2021, uh, meeting of the Advisory Panel on Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Systems. I am Eitan Nasreddin Longo, the chair. Let us introduce ourselves. I will go down the handy list that I have here on the right-hand side of my screen and begin with, of course, I can't read it because the program is designed for someone with the eyesight of a two-year-old. 802-505-9147. Hi, that's Robin from Crime Research. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Karen Gannett. Hi, Karen Gannett from Crime Research Group. Loretta Sackey, please. Loretta Sackey, policy analyst from Council of State Government. Thank you. Sheila. Sheila Linton, um, Brattleboro Root Social Justice Center. She, her pronouns um, appointed by the current community. Attorney General, community at large. Thank you. Abigail Crocker. I am Abby Crocker from the National Center on Restorative Justice and the University of Vermont. Thank you. Tyler. Good evening, everyone. Tyler Allen, um, DCF. Jessica. Hi everyone, Jessica Brown, she, her pronouns. I'm uh, the supervising attorney of the Chittenden County Public Defender Office. Thank you. Chris Loris. Uh, Christopher Loris, Research Associate with Crime Research Group. Okay. Susanna. Hello, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. <clears throat> Jen Firpo. Hey there, Jen Furfo, she, her, uh, representing the Vermont Police Academy. Judge Grierson. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge representing the judiciary. And I don't know uh, if Pepper's going to stay with this group. I, I just want to acknowledge um, how much he's he's brought to, to this organization over the years he's been involved from day one. Um, in my view, uh, you know, a, a very central, uh, significant player in, in this entire discussion. And I'd like to think he's going to stay, but probably not. I don't know. Uh, but I just wanted to wish him well and thank him for all the, all the work he's done for this group and uh, have enjoyed working with you, Pepper. Thanks for that. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Morris. Hi, all. Elizabeth Morris, uh, Juvenile Justice Coordinator at DCF. Thank you. James Pepper. Uh, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Thank you very much, Judge Grierson. Thank you very much to all of you um, for your dedication. And I assume that I will stay on as a public, uh, just a member of the public. <laughs> Um, and be able to follow the work that you all are doing as I transition to my new role. Thanks, Pep. Representative Coach Christie, please. Hello, uh, I'm Representative Kevin Coach Christie, and I represent you all. <laughs> Thank you. Representative Lalonde. Uh, yes, uh, Mart Lalonde, and I represent South Burlington. I'm on the Judiciary Committee and just generally sitting in, but I understand I also will uh, perhaps share some information about the use of force bill. So nice to yes. see you. All. Sarah Bastomsky, please. Hi, folks. This is Sarah Bastomsky. Um, I am a new researcher, a research manager at CSG Justice Center working with Sarah Friedman um, and Loretta Sackney just sitting in tonight. Great, thank you. And Sarah Friedman. 
Hi, everyone. Sarah Friedman, also with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Great. David Scher. Good evening, David Scher, Assistant Attorney General representing the Attorney General's Office. Thank you. Captain Scribner. Captain Julie Scribner, Vermont State Police, Co-Director of Fair and Impartial Policing and Community Affairs, representing Commissioner Shirley. Julio Thompson. I am Julio Thompson. I'm really here as a member of the public, but um, I am an Assistant Attorney General, Director of the Civil Rights Unit in that office. Rebecca Turner. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner from the Office of the Defendant General. Olivia Voth. Hi, I'm Olivia. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a UVM student, and I'm also an intern with the Attorney General's Office, and I'll be taking minutes tonight. And thank you for that. Of course. <laughs> and last but not least, as they say, Monica Weber, who, without whose help, the technical side of this would have been quite a disaster this evening. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Monica Weber. I'm the Administrative Services Director at the Department of Corrections. I'm not an IT specialist, um, and I am the <laughs> representative <laughs> to the commissioner from the Department of Corrections, and I use she, her pronouns. Thank you. Anyone whom I did not call, this would be the moment. Um, I'm looking at my list, and it says I got everyone, but... This would be it, like a wedding, speak now. Okay, um, let us move on to the minutes from the 9 March meeting uh, last month. You all have them, I sent them out the other day. Um, are there any concerns, questions, additions, changes, errata, et cetera? Eitan, this is Sheila. I just noticed that I was not mentioned in the minutes, but I am mentioned in the document. Um, so ah. I would like my name to be in attendance in the minutes to reflect that Got I was it. up there. Okay. I think I have that. David, do you have it? Because you tit last month. You yeah, I have. have uh, to make sure I understand, Sheila, she wasn't in the uh, list of attendees, the but was your comments were accurately recorded. You're muted. You're muted. So sorry. I think there was only one comment in there. There was lots of other comments I didn't see. But aside from that, and trying to remember all of what that was, I just noticed that I wasn't in the attendance list. All right, thanks. Sorry. Anything else? Shall we move to accept the minutes then? So move, Sheila. Okay, second. A second, Monica. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. All abstaining. Okay, the minutes are approved. Thank you. Announcements. Um, the f two f that I would begin with. Um, Jeff Jones and Chief Don Stevens will not be able to be with us tonight. Um, and then, of course, as Judge Grierson noted, Pepper has been elevated. <laughs> Is it elevated, Pepper? It sounds like elevated. I don't know. I was, I was getting all ecclesiastical. It, like, it depends like, on how you how you think about it, I suppose. <laughs> depends on where you're okay. sitting. <laughs> What is the actual name of the position you're taking? I'm going to be the chair of the new newly created Cannabis Control Board. Right. Okay. And so I just wanted to note that publicly for the minutes. And, um, and thank you. And we look forward to keeping you in some form. <laughs> I can't imagine ever leaving this group, honestly. So I'll, I'm sure Good. I'll be here. Good. Does anyone else have other announcements before we get going? 
I have others, but I want to get anything else in before I dray on for a little bit. Seeing no hands, I will dray on for a bit. First, the developments with H317, an act relating to establishing a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics and a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Panel. I gave testimony on this last week as I emailed you all. Um, I also submitted names of a bunch of you um, as people who would be good as please testify, in other words. I believe it was Wednesday last week that I did this. It should be on YouTube if you're interested. Um, I was I was not entirely caught off guard. I just thought we'd have one more meeting to be able to look again at our list before I was going to speak about it. But that didn't happen. It's fine. Um, so I presented the list that we came up with at our last meeting to a joint um, Senate and House Judiciary Committee meeting. Um, I thought it went well. Um, Rebecca um, Turner also testified at that particular session. Um, it looks like it's the thing. It's that it's going to go through. There's a lot of energy behind it. Um, I did my best to impress upon the committees uh, the list of concerns that were stated in the minutes. Um, and I also presented the thinking of various ones of you who I just sort of, I wouldn't say quoted, but I paraphrased. Um, there, as I say, I spoke that, no, I spoke then about the importance of independence because that had come up as a very important um, theme for the housing of the Bureau. So I spent some time on that. Um, Others are coming soon, I believe. Judge Grierson, Sheila, I know, has been invited, and David Scher, at the very least. Pepper, I don't remember if you are you were on the list that I got or not. But in other words, there are a bunch of people from the channel who, who will be testifying about this. Um, so that that's the first announcement, or whatever, third, I guess, that I just wanted to give you an update on where H317 is at this point. Um, I would go on to the state of action items that were described at the last meeting and are outlined in the minutes. Um, I also spoke in support of repealing the sunset of this panel. That too went well. Uh, that will likely pass. Um, the people in the legislature want us to continue the work that we began with the 2019 report, and there seems to be a great deal of affinity for the idea that we have had of the deeper dive into the issues that that report raised. Um, and in that testimony, I was using both Pepper and Chief Stevens' ideas, but again, as I paraphrase them. Um, the last action item from last month had to do with the 2019 report and the Racial Equity Task Force and looking at points of collaboration with them. And rather than hear me blather on about that, I would ask that Director Susanna Davis will fill us in on that. Susanna, the floor is yours, please. Okay, I will use it responsibly. Um, first, apologies, everybody, for being a black square. I am assured that IT will eventually fix this. Um, but for now, please just try to imagine me fully clothed because I am. Um, so, yes, so the Racial Equity Task Force met last night. And um, our assignment from our previous meeting was to read the RDAP report, if we had not already, and to try to... Uh, so I guess, I'm sorry, backing up to when I and a couple of other RETF members came to your last meeting, uh, the March meeting, we sort of landed on um, looking for points, perhaps upstream factors that may be relevant to some of the topics that you all discussed in your 2019 report or any other other ancillary items um, that maybe you didn't have time to cover that the task force may be interested in covering. So with that in mind, um, the Racial Equity Task Force reread the RDAP's 2019 report and at, you know with a series of thought questions, including but not limited to, 
what has changed since the writing of this report, what are the upstream factors contributing to this that we may want to address, et cetera. Um, so some of the feedback that we got last night that kind of helped our helped set our direction or what appears to be our direction were um, highlighting recommendation C in particular, which appears on page five of your report, having to do with uh, better and more expansive data collection. Um, noting that 317 appears to be moving, that's something the task force doesn't necessarily think it needs to focus on. Um, one of the suggestions during the conversation last night also was including things like pedestrian stops when we talk about data collection and, and traffic data. Um, and then there was a whole lot of discussion about mental health, um, supporting people at all stages through the system from intake all the way through things like parole. And what I appreciated about it was that um, our members were looking at it really in terms of um, how do we create an accommodations plan for people, which kind of reframes the way that we think about mental, uh, mental illness. So it, it sounds like that's kind of the direction that the task force wants to look is to focus on mental health issues and how they relate to the upstream and downstream effects of criminal justice disparities. Um, some of the questions we had were um, what kind of support for post-incarceration was the RDAP um, maybe thinking about if, if you all had considered it, things like housing and employment, which are issues that fuel recidivism. Um, some members were interested in looking at the, the non-consensus items that you all had at the end of the report to see if, if any of those were items, um, tales that, that we might be interested in picking up on. Um, looking closer at Team 2 initiative and whether the, um, what, you know, where it is, if it's working and what we can do to beef it up. And I think those are kind of the highlights. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking at you, but um, that's kind of where we ended up. So our next steps are to um, distill that conversation from last night and, and come up with a couple of high-level bullet points for the, a potential work product around that, um, which, which a few of us are going to meet on next week. So again, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily set, um, set in stone that that's the full breadth of what we're going to look at, but that appears to be some of our most immediate feedback following um, reading of you all's report. Thank you. So we're all going to, I mean, we, the RDAP, I guess I'm saying here, we'll look over this, I hope, beginning um, with our next meeting. I know things keep cutting in, partly because the legislature <laughs> and has needs of us, but um, I'm hoping that next meeting we'll be able to start taking a look at that collaboration with the Racial Equity Task Force. Does anyone have any questions of any of this? We talked about the uh, H317, um, the repeal of the sunset of the RDAP, and then the collaboration with the Racial Equity Task Force. Does anyone have any questions of me or Susanna this, on those items? Pepper. Uh, thank you, yeah, uh, Susanna, did, did you guys, I mean, this kind of fundamental question that we've been grappling with that you were privy to from our last meeting is just where to house the Bureau of Racial Statistics, Justice Statistics. And I'm wondering if uh, if, if you all in your group, uh, the Racial Equity Task Force last night, tried to tackle that at all. Um, and, you know, I know that, uh, you know, one of your mandates is trying to identify data reporting and um, identify kind of sources of systemic racism throughout um, all of the state government. And I'm wondering if that kind of, if that intersection with H317 um, means that, you know, you and the Racial Equity Task Force feel like it should be housed in your shop or um, if that was even a topic of conversation. No, we actually didn't even talk about it, um, but I know that's the big question on the table. And um, I, I think most of the conversation around it that I've had has probably been just listening to you all talk about it. And I remember a couple of meetings ago, you all had a rundown of all the possibilities. I think you, Pepper, had a pros and cons list. Um, and, and I think that the group felt strongly that independence would be important. And I tend to agree for any kind of watchdog entity, I think that um, 
that independence is big. I know the admin has proposed putting it in legal aid um, and there's a few other options on the table. So no, the task force didn't talk about it last night and I don't think we're any closer to having a real idea of what we think is best, unfortunately, um, than, than anyone that's, else. Is. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, I know it's a tricky conversation, but I just was curious, but thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing uh, no hand. Uh, yes. Sure. Uh, oh, go ahead. This would this be an appropriate time to uh, uh, interject uh, a few thoughts about H three one seven? Um, yeah. sure. Why not? Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if if I may be so bold, um, reviewing the notes uh, from the speakers uh, that have presented so far, including uh, your chair, um, uh, Rebecca, uh, and others, and then looking at the uh, supporting statutes around RDAP uh, 338, um, Section 19, uh, the racial, uh, oh. <laughs> spent a lot of time uh, in the uh, green books in the last couple of days. Yeah. But, but what uh, the short version of what uh, I started to see is it kept coming back to uh, RDAP's um, ability to possibly be at least the umbrella advisory agency, you know, for the Bureau. Uh, and thinking in terms of not creating another wheel because it already exists and you all are here. Um, and there is a direct link to all of the uh, data points that are talked about in 317. And so taking that to the to the next level, you start saying, okay, that might sound okay. So how could this maybe be implemented? So you start to look at our partners uh, in this work. And we've got the national um, the Center for Restorative Justice. Um, <laughs> you've got UVM, right? VLS, and just you know the list just goes on. Um, we've got CRG, um, and and its strength. We've got CSG that's been helping us through this process. And so maybe to allay some of the difficulties around creating a whole nother entity, taking a look at, you know, how could we get this work done if RDAP decided to be the focal point on getting that done? And then what would it take? Uh, and the possibilities uh, are, are pretty limitless, you know, like actually. Um, you, you look at justice reinvestment and the work that, you know, we've been doing, and then those outcomes and the supporting legislation that's come out, it, it keeps repointing back uh, to this group uh, in a number of different ways. Um, and I, I know it's 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 different uh, the thinking, uh, the perspective, but sometimes different is good when you're looking at shifting the paradigm. 
but the thing that I find most interesting in it is the people in this group. And, and that's where the strength comes uh, in, in this process. We, we probably still, you know, like need to, uh, you know, well, not probably, you know, there's a lot of detail pieces that would need to be, to be nailed down. But I think that um, the, the general uh, scope, you know, of the concept uh, has, has merit. Uh, we've started to reach out to the key partners uh, in this. Uh, uh, the spoke with uh, uh, Professor Sand. Uh, we've made some initial uh, reach outs to uh, UVM. Um, we've made some initial contacts with uh, CSG. Um, you know, still yet, you know, nothing formative, you know, as yet. But I think the the concept uh, has merit. Um, so that that's the Cliff Notes version. Okay. You know, more to um, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. No, I was going to say more to follow, Mr. Chair. Okay. <laughs> um, this was. I, I thank you, Coach. I wanted just to sort of point out to people, this was sort of going to be the brief discussion of um, housing of H317 at the end of the agenda. Um, my suggestion is that we go back to that, but I also want to say that hearing what Coach's points are, this is, I think, clearly going to be at the top of what we're doing next month, if not before, in fact. Um, when this was brought up to me, I spoke to the panel's sense of reluctance around this issue, that if we were to take this on, I spoke to, first of all, our tremendous need for administrative support, and also a need to kind of reconceive at least a part of our work. Um, I those are issues that would have to be taken up and that's a discussion that is lengthy and needs to happen and i would be perfectly happy for it to happen right now but there are two other things that are absolutely pressing because one of them i have to convey your thoughts to another committee on thursday morning so i'm coach is that all right if we sort of put that back for a little right now oh sure you know it, it, it as as you can imagine this isn't uh, um you know looking for a final answer okay all right and so, so i'm bookmarking that thank you and we're going to get back to that um but i do want to uh move on to race and sentencing data. Um, this is a report pursuant to Act 148 of last year. Um, you'll recall Pepper always speaks very well about that um, first numbered paragraph of Section 19 of Act 148. That would be the part that we didn't do, by the way. Um, and I want to also point out we didn't do it because we looked at it and went, this can't be done by the 1st of December. Let's do what we can do. And that's what we did. However, let me read that paragraph to you. We were asked to perform an initial analysis of sentencing patterns across the state to identify where the use and length of incarceration may result in or exacerbate racial disparities and make any related proposals for legislative action, including recommendations for further study, unquote. Um, you all may remember that Crime Research Group and of course Rob and Joy were specifically going to turn their attentions to that task. And Robin has done exactly that sort of work and you've gotten those files from her this afternoon and she's now going to present that to us. So 
Karen, Robin, yeah. Robin, Karen, <laughs> take it away. Okay. Yeah, Karen, I'm gonna start so I, I apologize to everybody. First of all, this is Robin. I'm on the phone because I live in Vermont and, and the video thing isn't really a thing for me. Um, so uh, Karen is going to be the person who does the slides and I'm going to be the person talking about it. So Karen, when you are ready. I've got the first one up. The PowerPoint? Yep. Okay, good. So um, just to tell you what I sent you, I sent you three documents this afternoon. Uh, one uh, should look familiar already to you. That's a PDF, um, and that was actually in your um, appendix to your report. Uh, that was uh, similar to what Connecticut had done, uh, and so we just pulled together the same thing that Connecticut did um, and submitted it to you. If we have time, we'll get to that. Um, I think the highlights of that um, – are how many people go through the system and don't ever end up with a guilty charge, and um, the distribution of um, defendants between felony and misdemeanor charges. But we can go over that later. Um, the data that we're going to go over now comes from the judiciary. That said, the judiciary um, doesn't create some of this data. So the police department data, the, the race of the defendant, that's all coming in, as we've talked about before, from the state's attorneys and the police, right? It's coming in from the police departments into the system. They are not independently collecting that data. Um, the data that I get from the judiciary, we get a, a monthly uh, extract from their system. Uh, I am not subject to the um, expungements. So these data includes um, those cases where, the, where it's actually been expunged. Um, because of that, um, and a few other reasons, we do not um, report out when there are five or fewer people in a particular category because you might be able to identify them. I understand, Sheila, that you have an objection to that um, and that I'm not gonna try to paraphrase it, but um, I, because of my user agreement with the courts, um, we really try not to identify anyone. So if there's five or fewer in the data, you will see an asterisk, um, and that just is to tell you that there were five or fewer people uh, in that um, group. In one other caveat about this, so this was just, um, this is the data that we always get. Um, this was a quick analysis. Nobody's gonna make public policy based on this because it's not cleaned. Um, it's a quick, um, quick look at stuff. Um, and included in this is the way, um, and for Sarah B from Council of State Governments, um, one thing I forgot to tell you yesterday when we chatted was these data also include probation violations. So the way the data are structured in um, the files, probation violations show up as a charge with a docket, but they don't show up as a probation violation. So I haven't uh, gone through and, and done the math to extract all those. So these numbers aren't final. This is just a general, um, general look uh, at some of the way the distribution happens. The two files that you have that will cover these data are the uh, PowerPoint and then the Excel spreadsheet just follows the PowerPoint, but also gives you some of the individual numbers um, that are used in this. Uh, what one of the things I just want to go over so Karen the next slide about the prior research. Yep, it's up. Thank you. The um, what we know and you'll see in this presentation as well that defendants of color are not equally distributed among the counties. Um, and this is going to lead to disparities and that's um, not distributed uh, within the crime categories as well and we'll, we'll explain that. Uh, black defendants are the largest non white race in the data and that. You'll see that for five years worth of data, for example, um, only about 35 uh, charges were disposed of, or dockets were disposed of, um, that had an indigenous defendant. So five years worth of data, 35 potential people. Um, so these numbers can get really small. And then we did a prior study that um, Council of State Governments is also looking at, which is on um, the role of criminal histories in impacting the sentences. And we know that these out-of-state criminal histories and the uh, in-state criminal histories are driving some of these incarcerated sentences. I did not pull rap sheets this time for this look at it. Um, but we do suggest that this continued use of, of 
the rap sheets and the criminal histories in sentencing um, is acting kind of like a stamp on the system, and it's saying, even though we know about all the systemic racism, we're still going to use these records that are generated by the system to continue sentencing people. And so we've been saying you might want to look at that practice of um, where we use criminal histories and what the goal of that is. So any questions before I go on? I think nope. not. Okay. So next slide. So the, um, the court data contains the agency that made the arrest. Uh, and what I did is I just looked at, um, and you'll see the, the numbers on that spreadsheet if you want to look at the raw numbers. Um, eight police departments accounted for 61% of the dockets with a black defendant in these five years. Burlington was up there as number one with 1,000 dockets, and then it goes down um, the next Brattleboro PD, 279 dockets. Uh, South Burlington, 2014, Rutland, 2012. Um, Sorry, 2000, uh, 212. Winooski, 198, and it goes down. But these of departments accounted for, like I said, 61% of the dockets, um, but only 33% of the dockets were the white defendant. So this, looking at the uh, Chittenden County representation here, um, that's going to be um, kind of skewing whatever, whatever numbers we look at. Yes, did I hear a question? It would be me, Rob, and it's Karen. Would you just explain to them what a docket means? Sure, so what I did here is um, in Vermont, and, and not every state does this, we're lucky data-wise that we do, generally one person is on a docket and that will have all the charges related to, um, if they're known at the same time of filing, um, uh, related to that incident. So if I am arrested for domestic violence and arrested for um, interfering with a um, with emergency services, I'll have one docket with two charges. Um, and so I was just counting the dockets, the total number of dockets that can include many charges. Um, but this is a way to get at what a case is, and that's there's a lot of definitions um, that people use in in these studies. Um, so just for this, I just looked at the dockets. All right, next slide. Can you, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding what you're saying in that slide. And are you and this saying, is Sheila, right? I this can't is see anyone, Sheila. so. Yes, okay. this is Sheila. Um, are you saying that the 61% of the docket, so docket could be seen as a person in a way, it's their, it's their docket, and that out of all of these dockets added up throughout these eight departments, which are like, you know, 2,000, almost 3,000 or, or something, 61% of that 2,500 dockets were black defendants, basically. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that the, out of all of the departments in the state, these eight departments accounted for 61% of the black defendant. So why are, I guess, why is it these eight departments being teased out? Is that because in the other areas it's less diverse? I, I'm, I'm confused. At, I guess, I'm making no statements that. about why. Um, that's what further researcher, what further research would say. I, what I did is I looked at what departments over a five-year period um, were arresting at least, or not arresting, what departments over this five-year period had at least 100 dockets associated with a black defendant? So they, that was the minimum. Um, so this gives you an idea of what departments um, are making arrests of, of black defendants, what, and that it's heavily skewed. So one of the departments that's not here is the state police. Um, and the state police and the data show up on their individual barracks, but none of the individual barracks were arresting enough uh, defendants of color to be in this category. So the only statement I'm making is that eight, per, eight these, these departments are responsible for over half of the dockets in the criminal court of black defendants. Thank you. Yep. Julie, you have your hand up. 
Yeah, I just can you I just want to clarify, I think um, I think you just clarified it enough with Sheila, but um, so any of the departments that had if if one of the if one of the VSP barracks had say 95 arrests of or, or I'm sorry, accounted for 95 dockets of a person of color over that five year period that wouldn't show up here. Is that correct? In this slide, I can get you the number. I just was trying to narrow down. And when you look at it and you say, wow, these eight departments are accounting for over half. Um, this is interesting to me. It may, may not be to anyone else, but it was to us. OK. So it, yeah. but that's what I think. And that was what I was looking at is, but it, if it's one particular barracks has 95, but out of the 10 barracks, there could be 950, but they don't show up because right. they're all I didn't add you. I didn't add you guys up, right? So I did not take okay. all the barracks and add you up. I can. Okay, thank um, you. I just again, this was a really quick analysis, something we could do in a few hours. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Rebecca. Robin, did you say, and I missed it, and I'm sorry if I did miss it, how many departments there are in the state to compare the something. eight? Uh, 84, I want to say, Karen. We, we should know this by now. Yeah, I think it's I think it's closer to like 78. And are you counting? Because I heard you say that the individual state trooper barracks are counted separately, or is that one counts well, as one? That would count um, as one. In, in the 78, that would count as one. So if you add their their barracks to the 78, yeah. um, but this also includes, um, you know, fish and game. Um, are represented in here. Department of Liquor Control are represented. The Attorney Generals, when they make an arrest. So eight out of 78. Yeah. If, of these eight departments here, do you have a comparison to the demographics of um, black adults, I guess, would be the comparison? Or in the department or, or in the town? Or what do you I guess? In? Yes, I guess some of these towns, are, are they in the same county? I guess some of them are. But it'd be interesting yeah. to see, I mean, in terms of a contrast, too, in terms of not only is it interesting that eight has 61, capture 61, but it'd be interesting to see the counties that they fall in, the towns specifically, what are the, what's the demographic um, breakdown? Yeah, so, People of color and white. Um, and you can, um, but we know that not everybody commits crimes or gets arrested in the towns that they live in. Um, and so, I think, you know, it, but yes, I mean, one of the, um, I think that's, you know, part of one of the things that you guys looked at um, was adding census data over this. Um, so we can, um, to those extent that it, that it works. Um, I think, you know, as we're kind of talking this through, um, it becomes kind of clear, and we'll see on the next slide as well, um, and this may help uh, you know, kind of clarify people's thinking a little bit. So Karen, if you go to the next slide. Yep. Wait, can I, before we yep. do that, can I, there's one other question before we move on. Oh, I'm sorry. From that, um, Julio. Yeah, yeah I, I guess my question was, aren't these with the, I think the only admit, <clears throat> Exceptions maybe being Winooski aren't, and the omission of Essex, aren't these the largest cities in Burlington? Aren't they all in the top eight? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I do know, though, that, and that was one of the reasons why I looked at, are they also contributing the same amount of white defendants? Sorry, it's a very busy time for the dog right now. Um, and these same departments only account for 33% of all the white defendants in this five-year period. But yes, um, certainly looking at um, you know, how, um, how the larger uh, cities are comparing uh, to the smaller ones. Um, you know, I think the only thing that surprised me here, and it just, it, you know, it's nothing um, for state police. Just, I was just surprised that none of the barracks showed up. So, so um, Williston doesn't show up, and Williston's a very busy barracks, um, but that doesn't meet this threshold. So. Okay. Now, next slide. 
Yeah, go ahead. Okay. What's up? All right. So here what I did is I just, this is dispositions. This is unique dockets by county during this five-year period, 2015 to 2019. Um, and you can see what I highlighted were just the top three counties um, for um, the non-white race categories. Um, so you could get a sense of how um, people are distributed throughout the state um, in the criminal court. One, you'll notice, so first I want to say that these data, this race data is coming in to the courts from the police report, right? Um, so the, the courts aren't actually um, collecting this data. And these are the categories that the um, CAT RMS system has. Um, missing means that nothing was recorded. Um, it's supposed to be um, self-identified race. And um, not reported or other um, is different than missing. Not reported means that uh, the defendant, it's supposed to mean that the defendant did not report his or her race. Um, and other means that they chose to identify other than the options that we give people. So if you look over that missing category, um, you'll see there's a lot of numbers there. Um, we don't use the court data um, for determining, um, for doing like a, a hefty, a really good uh, quality race analysis. We would actually use the criminal histories and we've audited those and the criminal histories, the rap sheets um, don't have this level of missing data. In fact, I think it was uh, less than 2% of all race uh, data was missing when we, when we did the audit of that and we audited all 14 counties. Um, so there's other sources that are better um, and this is just to you know, keep in mind as, as you're looking at the, these data connections and these data, um, you know, how to do analysis by filling in missing data and then where do we really have to, as a state, get better at collecting data. Um, and clearly these missing categories um, are concerning. But if we look at Chittenden County and black defendants, for example, right, so there were 1,914 dockets disposed of. It disposed does not mean guilty, just means that the, the criminal court closed that case in, in these years. Um, 1914 were from, um, for Chittenden County, and about 1,500 of those were from those police departments on the, on the previous slide. So you can see how those police departments in particular are kind of, you know, um, swaying this. Um, any questions on this slide? None seen. Okay, thank you. All right, next slide, Karen. Yep, it's up. All right, so there's a list. Um, for those of you that um, have never seen like the raw data, um, there's um, every subsection of a statute has a code that's in the data. And this is called a charge code. Uh, and what we do is we have a master list of this charge code that um, the Defender General, the Attorney General's office and the court administrator's office and I all sat down five, 10 years ago. And we um, categorize crimes into these larger categories because um, it's helpful if you, we just wanna know about drug categories that we assign, you know, this label um, in the data for all the drug charges and we can just talk about drug charges or we could talk about domestic violence charges without having to go ahead and, um, you know, pull each individual um, charge code for those, for those statutes. So this, this is an agreed upon list of uh, crimes and every time the legislature adds a new crime, um, I kind of check in with Mary at the Defender General's office. Um, and somebody over at the Attorney General's and say, do you guys agree with this? And we just categorize it. So these categories show you, and this was just, um, so overall, these are charges, not dockets. So charges, uh, again, to go back to the domestic violence example, if I am arrested for domestic violence and interfering with a, um, you know, emergency services, I would be in this chart twice. I would be in the domestic row and I would be in the public order row. Um, so I would, so it's not individuals, this is total number of charges. And in the PowerPoint, sorry, in the Excel spreadsheet, you have the raw numbers of this. 
Um, and I just highlighted here where um, for non-white defendants, their representation in these bands was higher than their overall representation um, in the in the in, in the sample. So um, charges with black defendants accounted for overall 5.17 percent of all the charges disposed of during this time period. But if you look at um, the the categories where um, overrepresented um, robbery. Um, weapons, drugs, um, and it's different. You can see for some of the other non-white races as well. I want to highlight this weapons stuff here. Um, this is a new crime. I was actually, um, this is, and I'll defer to one of the um, practitioners. Uh, this was in 2015, you guys passed this, and it, it's basically like a felon in possession um, or along those lines um, of prior violent crime. I think what stood out, these are really no low numbers, so this 10% um, for weapons of black char uh, charges with black defendants, um, I think it's actually only 14 people, and there were 101 um, charges with white defendants. Um, so this is a new law. I don't, in order to see if that's being um, administered fairly, that is that everyone who's eligible to be charged is, or you know that um, that people, uh, white defendants aren't not being charged with this, but defendants of color are. You'd have to pull the criminal histories. Um, what kind of shocked me about this is that we are a heavily armed state, um, and so I was surprised that white defendants weren't higher. Um, and so I don't know if any of the practitioners want to kind of shed light on that or what this law is is how it's being used. Um, but that was, that's a flag for me. Anyone? Not really. <laughs> well, um, I just wanted to, this is Sheila. I, I, I don't have an answer to your question, but I have a question. And mm -hmm. I, um, I had a question of what is actually considered a weapon, it, uh, what I was curious about. And I was actually curious about the same thing that you said. and. You know, I'll, I can make my own speculations that um, a lot of people who are black and brown, that tends to be weapons and it tends to be for white folks, it's their hunting, it's their everyday right. And it, so it does make me um, question um, how that weapon um, has been interpreted and, and how it's been used and how race might play or what I think clearly plays a potential huge role in that. So... I don't know if other people have any thoughts or comments to that, but my question is um, about what is considered a weapon. So this is a firearms charge, so it has to be a firearm, if, I, if I'm correct here. Julio has his hand up. Okay. So he may be able to... Go ahead, Julio. I, I mean, you're... The law that I'm aware of... Uh, I'm not talking about decisions to enforce the law, but just the actual law on the books is entitled Pur Purposes Persons Prohibited from Possessing Firearms, Conviction of Violent Crime. Yep. And so it defines everything you would think of as a firearm, um, excluding antique firearms like replicas and flintlocks muskets, that sort of stuff, but handguns and rifles and shotguns. Um, and then they list a number, any number of violent crimes, uh, you know, range, and not all of them, I would, I, you know, there's an argument as to whether it's violent or not. Like I would see, um, uh, like one of them is conviction of possession with intent to distribute a controlled substance in another jurisdiction if that jurisdiction, uh, per, you know, if, if that offense is prohibits you from carrying a firearm under federal law. Uh, so there are a number of uh, drug related offenses uh, that are included as the category of violent crimes. And then the rest are ones that you would recognize things like uh, sexual assault, um, you know, the, the the usual what we would consider, you know, causing bodily injury to people. Um, 
but there are there are a couple of provisions in it that might warrant um, discussion among this group because they really are, or the leg Vermont legislature construed a number of drug transaction related violations within the category of violent crime. Uh, Rebecca. A uh, different, different question for Robin. Uh, okay. I see that you highlighted a bunch of boxes and I, I, I take that to mean that you highlighted anything that was above the grand total in that respective column. Is that right? That was my goal. I may have missed a few here or there, but yes, that was yeah, my goal. No, no, so that's that's yeah. helpful. What, one thing that strikes me, because it is striking how many are lit up, um, but I would also be interested in finding, again, a comparison to these categories of race based on demographics in the state. This is a statewide analysis of offenses, right? Because I think that this only gives you a, a sense of proportionality within but I think even more significant for us to understand these disparities is to see how this compares with the demographics outside the state um, generally. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Do you have do you have that sense? Do you know offhand what is um, the demographics? No, and so I just want to be um, so one of the things that we would have to do here is this is charges, not people. So um Let's say I get busted with um, some pot, oh no, I can't do that anymore, um, some um, cocaine and some heroin. I'm in, in the same arrest, I'm in there twice in that drug category. Um, so we'd have to, so this, we have to first, we'd have to get down to single people, like just let's get down to the actual number of, of, of people and then these numbers may look different. Um, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Uh, okay. Which actually so one of the things on that... the, um, and I just want to point out, Rebecca, you have on that on the PDF, and we can talk about this another time. But I did look at um, the number of uh, unique individuals when I can determine that, and, and that's a it's a guess um, by the number of dockets and the number of charges and the number of cases so that it you know it generally doesn't look like for example defendants of color are getting stacked with a lot of charges compared to white defendants um, but we would need to kind of sort that out so this isn't number of people this is number of charges statewide monica has a question mm -hmm. hi robin um, hi I'm having I'm I'm remembering the time when when the Department of Corrections <laughs> had to file a, re, a report to try and answer some of these questions with the the data that we had um, and and all of the questions that we got that um, you're getting a lot of the same right, ones. Yeah. And so thank you for um, for doing this because it's really interesting. And one of the things that we did, which again I'm not a statistician um, like you are. But one of the things we did do when we were thinking about the same question that people are bringing up around, well, comparing it to what's the ge geography or the breakdown in the, in the county or the town um, is to try and do like a study of what would be expected versus just right. sort of saying there's a, there's a percentage of this many people of right. this category in this town and this is how many of them were you know arrested or charged but to do that and i don't know if that's a i know that's a much more um you yeah know, and i that's a methodological thing that maybe people don't want to get into <laughs> but i do think that is an important thing to consider so i just wanted to uh, put it out there right we we would want to know like what the expected uh distribution is um for example of domestic violence offenders um because we know that these these i'm going to gender them as male tend to come back a lot right um, and so we, um, I think that one of the reasons why I generally don't kind of put all that information in is that this is something that, uh, the Bureau that you've recommended, or this is something that you as RDAP, we need, you, you need to sit down and, and decide this going forward are like the three measures of, um, 
that we want to look at all the time. So we want to look at the measurement of people in the town, all right, so as, as that. But then we want to get at, right, so um, in that PDF you have, and that was just for 2019, there were 449 zip codes uh, for residences of the defendants. Um, so what does it mean to be from a town? Um, and uh, what's another measure that we could look at in addition to that measure. So I think those are discussions to be had and that I know it's been, it's often helpful when there is this kind of agreed upon definition and then that way the judiciary is doing it the same way, the cor corrections is doing it the same way, the cops are doing it the same way, everyone's putting out that same statistic. I just really respectfully suggest that it not be the statutory definition of recidivism that wasn't helpful um but everything else you know like so 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 some kind of agreement among all the um among all everyone that these are the numbers that we want to see and i am happy to to be part of that conversation but might be helpful um but i think that's something that the bureau should do um and that the individual players uh should be a part of yeah, I appreciate that, and I think that's a really good suggestion because otherwise, I think that the the questions could take take us in a million different places. They're all really interesting. Yeah, but. and and we all, you know, everyone keeps their data at a different level. So the the police are generally incident based, um, and that incident is, uh, you know, the the uh, me getting arrested for the domestic violence and and the. Um, and the interference with emergency services. I show up in their data on one line. I show up in the court data on two lines. I show up in, in DOC's data on one, on two, well, it depends on the time, but two lines, right? Um, but you're counting me as one offender. Um, so, you know, even getting down to what unit are we counting and when we are looking at these individual units of whether it's incidents or people um, or offenses, um, what measures do you want with those with those measurements? Raman, this is Aton. Yes, yes. I am. What I'm look. What you're presenting to us. Let me. Is this correct in all? It our results. Looking at a rather, shall we say, disorganized not very well coordinated system of data systems, as it were. These are the results from that consideration. Um, well, these are just the results from the judiciary. I, right, I'm not merging with okay. anyone else here, except for the fact that the judiciary has taken information from the police and put it into their database. So, okay. but I didn't go back and look up the incidents in Nybridge, for example, and cross-reference right. any. I, did, I didn't do any of that. I didn't pull anyone's criminal histories, and I didn't follow them into the Department of Corrections. So this was just a quick, this is what we have in the court database. Let me Got give you it. some charts um, that you. might be of interest to you. Yeah. Got um, it. Any other questions before we move on to sentences? Not that I see, and... It's about 7.10, so I, yep. we've got a couple other things we've got to do tonight. Yep, and I will go through this one pretty quickly. Okay. This, this last section. Um, so, again, every charge, um, you know, most of our statutes have several subsections and different ways to violate them. Um, and uh, for this next analysis, I just picked four crimes that only had one that I just had to pull out one subsection to do um, and, and we could talk about. And that's because some of the other ones would require a conversation and agreement between the judiciary and, and everybody, um, you know, the, the attorneys, et cetera, that these offenses, these subsections are similar enough that we can analyze them together and these subsections should be, um, you know, taken out and analyzed separately. And that's a discussion that, that you know, should happen um, but we didn't have time. And this is also um, crimes that I looked at when we looked at race and sentencing in that report, um, just because they were large volume crimes um, and at least had a sufficient number of non-whites uh, who were uh, convicted at the time, and this was a while ago, um, that we could do some sort of analysis. So these sentencing numbers come from the judiciary. Um, these are charges 
not people again. Um, so for assault and domestic, if I had, if I came back during those five years, um, I'm in here twice. If I had several, if I, you know, have a charge on an incident um, where um, the spouse is the victim and a child is a victim, I'm in here twice. Um, so not people, uh, charges. And what I highlighted so that you could look at is just where uh, charges with black defendants um, were uh, sentenced disproportionately to uh, white defendants. Uh, for assault domestic, you definitely see that with um, deferred sentences and um, incarcerative sentences. And um, the same with um, assault, assault simple. One big caveat here um, is that in these, um, in the sentence to incarceration includes um, pre-approved furloughs. Uh, so that could be work crew or I don't know what else we do now. Um, but so that shows up as a sentence to incarceration doesn't necessarily mean anyone did um, a day, um, but there, it's hard to tease out of the data. That's a free text field. So that's something that has to be kind of, um, that's always been an issue. Okay. Um, next slide, because this one's interesting. Let me just ask any questions on this slide before I move on? Seeing none. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right. So here, uh, for uh, uh, 2.5 grams of more of cocaine, Chittenden sentenced no white defendants to incarceration, um, but 12 charges for black defendants to incarceration. And then for less than 2.5 grams, Chittenden and Wyndham both sentenced nine charges of black defendants to incarceration. So if you go down to the lower uh, right-hand corner uh, where you see cocaine possession less than 2.5 grams, and you look at that incarceration number of 29 black, uh, 20, 29 charges that had black defendants, 18, nine came from Chittenden, nine came from Wyndham. Um, and then this issue in Chittenden County where no white defendants during these five years were sentenced to incarceration, um, but 12 charges for black defendants were. Questions? Seeing none. Can, can, okay. Eitan, oh. looking at the, this is Martin, I, I apologize. Are we looking at the right slide? Because I don't see the number 12 or the number 18 that was referred to by Robin. Um, so 12 should be up at the top. It should say sentence distributions, Chittenden sentence, no white defendants. Do you see that at the top? It's the couple yes. sentences at the very top of the page. Yeah, and then if you go down to the bottom right-hand side um, and you see incarceration number 29 for charges with black defendants. Okay. For we're the right one, we're the right one. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's okay. It's okay. okay. Yep. Julio um, has so, oh. Yes. Oh. No? Julio? No, the representative had asked the same question I was going to ask, so I'm fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. Who, uh, Robin, can you remind me of the time frame for this? 2015 to 2019. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yeah, so the so Robin, the, the key takeaway from this slide is what? Um, well, I think again, going back to this geographic disparity um, and you know, one of the suggestions that we make at the end is um, while you're waiting for the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics to get up and running um, and co beginning collecting all the data and filling in all the data gaps, that doing um, a, an audit um, of case files um, that, are, you know, we've done this before um, where you take a, a certain percentage of, you know, you sample the cases um, and you sit there and you code the, you code the files um, and try to get a, you know, a qualitative analysis of what's happening, especially in Chittenden County. Um, that's okay. one of our, you know, that would be one of our suggestions is that we clearly we have now the, this county difference going on um, that uh, you might want to look into and, and figure out why. Okay. Um, then the next slides, Karen, you can actually just kind of um, 
there, these are the measures of central tendency. So um, on the minimums, um, and I won't go through them for time, um, but there was nothing really outstanding here. What you can look at is on um, the only one that was, Karen, if you can go to the last slide of those, not the last slide of the presentation, but the last slide of the bars, incarceration minimums for cocaine possession. Yep. over 2.5 grams yep. here you'll see that so again this is the same excuse me, same crime where we had the um the disparity in chittenden county we also have a disparity in the mac in the time that somebody is sentenced to um in the minimum like the the, the highest number there right so it was 4.5 years for black defendants um, was the highest minimum and it was uh four um, years for white defendants so black defendants had this higher um, threshold um, on all of them for uh, the minimum sentence for cocaine possession over 2.5 grams. And here, unlike all these other crimes, for incarceration, we actually have almost like, you know, an equal amount of black defendants and white defendants. And these are charges of uh, black defendants and white defendants, not necessarily individuals, um, but something to look into. And then the last analysis I did um, to the next slide, Karen, yep. on dispositions by age group. This one just actually came to me. We're doing a recidivism study for DCF, and I noticed some funny numbers there, um, and it just got me thinking. Um, and so what I did is I grouped uh, the defendants in these age bands and then um, just kind of highlighted for the non-white defendants what the top three percentages were. Um, and you'll see the raw numbers. Again, I've given you the raw numbers in the, um, um, Excel. In the Excel spreadsheet. Thank you. Um, so here, if we look at this age band of 17 to 20, the good news is, is that these kids are now being mostly sent down to juvenile court. So the, um, the disparities um, and the, and the, um, the, you know, the, the collateral consequences of getting a criminal conviction at such a young age um, will now be minimized if, if these kids are convicted or, or found delinquent um, by pushing them by pushing all these kids into the into the younger um, into juvenile court. So this is um, this was just an interesting um, so this disparity and, and I, I think it's a good thing that overall the state is doing this and that this will at least have some. Um, positive impact on, on uh, defendants of color going through the system. Um, so that this is where the age, the, the percentages were, um, and that the um, raw numbers you'll see are uh, below that in the in the Excel spreadsheet. And then just finally for the last slide, Karen. Yep. Um, You've got a couple questions. I don't know oh, if you okay. want to do that now. Yeah, sure. No, that's fine. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> First is Julie. Um, Karen and Robin, can you go back one more slide to the greater than two and a half grams, that one? Yep. So um, my question on this is, is this for, is this, would this have been for if this was their sole um, charge or their sole, I guess, no. conviction is probably the right word. If they were convicted of greater than two and a half grams plus a weapons violation, or is it just this is only uh, one? Do you know what no, I'm saying? No, so this is um, this is their sentence for the 2.5 grams or more. This is not the sentence. So the person who has a conviction for the weapons violation and the cocaine possession yep. is in this data. Um, they are here for the cocaine possession, and this is the sentence that they got on that. They are not here, yeah. right? So this is another analysis that you would do going forward is kind of what other charges were, were associated with this and what upward or downward pressure did those other charges perhaps put or exert on the, on the sentence on the minimum. Um, and I just, you know, so we report out the minimum sentence because that seems to be driving what uh, DOC does. Um, you know, there, there's also the maximums as well, and we can look at that some other time too. Okay, thank you. Yep. Just go ahead, Robin. You wanted to go to that last slide. I okay. Guess. So then the last slide. So this is just our suggestions um, while everyone's uh, working out the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics and everything that's going to get to get up and running. 
Um, we have really been saying constantly that, that um, some qualitative analysis might be really helpful. Um, so this audit of selected case files to identify themes, um, capturing people's stories uh, through structured interviews, t uh, text analysis and focus groups, and then analyzing that for ways that we can pinpoint areas in the system that can be changed. And then this is just, you know, um, my own kind of uh, legal analysis, you know, maybe for the law school there on, uh, you know, what laws do we still enforce that were passed because of racism or with the help of racism? And so we know that there are laws in the books that were passed because of racism um, and uh, to further white supremacy, but we still enforce those. Um, and so how do we as a, as a, as a culture or a community uh, reckon with that and what do we do? Um, and that's just something the law school can do. And that's what I got. Thank you. Other, uh, Julia. Now I can't read. Hold on, give me a moment. Julio, you have a question. Yeah, I also had a question on the same slide that uh, Captain Scribner had, if I could sure. go back two slides. <clears throat> so for the, um, for the comparisons here, it's 2.5 grams. So that could be three grams or that could be five kilos is that right it's like I it's think a, at five kilos you're into the trafficking subsection of that but i'll defer to the well, like what's the do you know what the for the offense like what the up, upper limit is i'll defer no there is none in the statute but i'll defer to the attorneys to say what happens in practice but yes there is a wide range of i don't know the, the weights uh, unless i mix it back in with the other data um to get the weights um okay and I didn't see anything here because I know you were looking at state and local data, but when we're talking about drug offenses for the higher amounts, you know, there are prosecutions that occur out of the U.S. Attorney's Office. Yeah. And I wonder, um, it, like that's mm -hmm. kind of selection effect in terms of, quote, big time offenders, because I think at least, uh, and we don't have any of the representatives of, of federal government here, but I, I think they would generally, t you know, opine that they go after, they try to go after the bigger fish. And so, yeah, I just don't know how that, uh, how that plays yeah. into how so the upper end offenders that you're looking at. Um, and so I, I do want to put a flag and say, uh, so that you bring up a really good point that we didn't actually, um, that wasn't included in the RDAP report, but I think should be discussed at some point, um, is that we don't know about that decision um, for the, in Vermont about when the feds step in and take a case uh, where some of the punishments are much harsher. Um, so uh, that, that is an, it, that's something that we haven't studied. Um, and working with the U.S. Attorney's Office to get them on board to share data would be helpful um, so that people could look at the disparate impact if there is, you know, of – uh, what happens when the feds come in? Are the feds picking up certain cases and only picking up um, cases of non-white defendants, or you know, is there a disparity there? I mean, it's beyond um, perhaps what the what the Vermont legislature could do, but um, yes, <laughs> that's something we would very much like to study someday. Um, but I'll leave it also to for the attorneys to answer the, that question about what's your general upper limit on the 2.5 grams. Okay. Um, Robin, on that last slide, and I say this kind of, well, hold on, I'll table that for a moment. Any other questions okay. or comments? Okay. Robin, I want to ask you about on this last slide, mm -hmm. is this something that I could help work with you with or something where we could get these broken down a bit more? Because I'm not sure that everyone's going to get what structured interviews, text analysis, what those <laughs> tools of qualitative analysis that I know way more than I want to know. <laughs> right. Um, I, think I do that, want people uh, to know we use actual computer programs. Like, you know, when you analyze right. the, the – like there's, there's, there's still computer programs involved. But, yeah. I, but I think that we may want to break those down more. Sure. Get these out then to the panel – and take this is obviously a beginning conversation what we've just done and bring yeah. this up again okay 
Yes, yeah, I'd, but I'd absolutely like, love to work with you on that, yep. Okay, because I'm feeling like that's the next step here is that this needs to be broken down more um, or filled out, I guess, would be more yeah. the proper term. Okay? Yeah, awesome. Great. Anyone else before we move on? Thank you so much. Yep, our and pleasure. And I knew Thank that. <laughs> I knew that <laughs> paragraph was going to be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is. Um, you know, and I think that we're certainly, I think one of the things that, you know, I hope the committee, you know, really considers is that conversation that Monica and I had about getting everyone to agree. These are at least, you know, three measures that we always want to see um, that help, you know, and to have that discussion. Okay. Great. Thank okay. you. I'm going to stop sharing now. There we go. Great. Thanks, Karen. Sure. Okay. I would like to move on to discussion of H145, an act relating to amending the standards for law enforcement use of force. Um, just as a preamble here, we have been asked to comment as a body upon H145. As I said at the beginning of the meeting, I will be testifying, testifying about this on Thursday morning at nine o'clock in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, it, it's on the agenda because I need to get a sense of the panel's thinking. I need to know what I'm saying, because at the moment, I have no clue. Um, Representative Lalan has very kindly offered to present this bill to us as he has been instrumental in um, getting this legislation moving through the legislature this session. And so now, without further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, Eitan. Um, so this bill, H-145, it actually has a few amendments uh, to a bill that we passed last September. Uh, in fact, mo most of the what you see, if you've looked at the bill H-145, is language that is going would go into law in July if this uh, bill does not end up getting passed and signed by the governor. Just FYI. So I'm going to take this by just explaining a little bit about what that bill does, and then point specifically to uh, where the amendments are in 145. Now I don't know if the Senate is going to ask you to just comment on what those amendments are or if they want your view on the whole thing. So I'll go ahead and kind of give you the high level of what, what this bill does. So last year we passed two bills involving police use of force, S-219, uh, which became Act 147, established a criminal offense uh, holding law enforcement criminally accountable if they used a prohibited restraint on a person and cause seriously serious bodily injury or death. So a prohibited, prohibited restraint was defined as a maneuver that impedes the flow of blood oxy or oxygen to the brain. In other words, it's a chokehold. Uh, so the second bill, S-119, which became Act 165, established a statewide statutory standard uh, for police use of force, including the use of deadly force. And Act 165 tightened the existing restrictions that are found in common law and court law on use of force in a number of ways. And I'll just hit the, the high points. First, in determining whether a use of force was justified, Act 165 requires a court to look at an officer's conduct and decisions leading up to the use of force. So did the officer seek to de-escalate the situation to avoid having to use force? Or did the officer instead escalate the situation, making the use of force inevitable? So without those, these new standards, you know, to determine if the use of force was justified, courts generally would look only to the moment when force is used, not what led up to the use of force. So that was a pretty significant change from underlying court law. Uh, second, the law says that any use of force must be reasonable, 
necessary and proportional in order for it to be found to be justified. Third, and this is a very important uh, change in the law as well, uh, when an officer knows that a person is impaired due to a mental illness or some other factor, the officer must take that into account in determining what, if any, force to use in the situation. Fourth, for use of deadly force to be justified, it must be objectively reasonable and necessary to counter an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. If there is a reasonable alternative to the use of deadly force to counter that threat, the officer has to go with that alternative. Also, the force has to, that is applied has to cease as soon as there is no longer a threat. And that also is a little bit different than uh, standard case law is, particularly the requirement of uh, there being a reasonable alternative. Um, it doesn't, the, what we put into law really doesn't stretch what we have in case law right now. It, it does follow uh, really a number of cases, uh, but it, it picks those cases and in in those precedents that really I think have the tighter restrictions. So fifth, Act 165, along with the other law that I mentioned, Act 147, banned chokeholds. And this is an important part. Although their use could be justified when deadly force was justified. Finally, the uh, Act, uh, Act 165, it had an effective date of July 1st, 2021, to allow the Department of Public Safety to produce a policy to put the use of force standards into effect. And DPS has dutifully been uh, you know, taken up the task and it continues to work on those implementing policies. But to assist it in drafting those policies, DPS came to us and asked for some clarifications of certain parts of the use of force law. And that's where H-145 comes in. And it provides the necessary clarifications, at least the ones that uh, the House Judiciary Committee agreed to. Uh, there were a couple of suggestions that we, we did not uh, agree to because we thought that they moved away from uh, where we were trying to go uh, with, with the standards. So, so under the laws we passed, well, first of all, you know, the primary need for the clarification involves prohibited restraints or chokeholds. So under the laws that we passed last year, an officer, again, who uses a prohibited restraint or chokehold, I'll just call them chokeholds, that results in death or serious bodily injury can avoid criminal liability by invoking the justifiable homicide defense. That defense applies if deadly force was justified under the standards that we have put into place. So the laws that we passed last year provides this indirect way of getting to the conclusion that use of a chokehold is permitted if deadly force is otherwise justified. So H-145, the amendment uh, is more direct, it's clearer and it's transparent in reaching that conclusion. So first, H-145 changes the terminology in the law that we passed last year Instead of the use of the term prohibited restraint, we're calling it what it is. We're calling it a uh, chokehold. Uh, second, <clears throat> we clarify the definition of chokeholds. Uh, we make it, you know, make the definition easier to use, more straightforward to make sure that we are covering the actions that we want to address. Third, it also makes clear that an officer must intervene when an other officer is using a chokehold when deadly force is not justified. And finally, it clarifies that a law enforcement officer may not use a chokehold unless deadly force is justified. Of course, that means that a law enforcement officer uh, may use a chokehold when faced with such a situation uh, that requires uh, deadly force. So these changes, I'm just about done, uh, but uh, these changes <clears throat> do not ease the restrictions on the use of deadly of, of chokeholds. You know, the statutory standards are still there for the use of deadly force. They remain intact. Uh, so before the, a chokehold can be used, uh, it must be objectively reasonable and necessary to defend against the imminent uh, threat of death or serious bodily injury. There has to be no other reasonable alternative to the use of that force. 
and it has to cease as soon as uh, uh, there's no longer that threat. So the bottom line is uh, we understood from law enforcement that there are situations where the use of a chokehold can be the best or really the only option that a law enforcement officer may use in a life or death situation. So if an officer's only option is to use a, a firearm, we'd rather not in certain situations have that be their only option uh, in that life and death situation. Uh, those are the, that's really the main thing that we did in the bill. We also extended the, the effective date to make sure that DPS has, has enough time to finish its policy making and its training. Uh, and uh, I think there were may, maybe a couple other clarification language, but but really it's the chokehold component on H uh, on H145. Um, but again, I don't know if they're going to be asking you for broader uh, input. What you think of the whole thing? I don't know. Uh, they but, never tell me. They just say show up. Right, right. And talk about this. Right, right. So so that that's, uh, I know there are other people who know a lot about this bill uh, who are in fact part of RDAP. And also I know Julio knows a lot about it and, and so does the captain as, as well. And uh, I think uh, she in fact testified if I'm remembering right. No, it wasn't you. It was, um, I'm trying to remember who it was that testified. Any yeah. event. So. Yeah, Major Jonas, I think. Yeah, but. that's what it was. That's a, that's who it was. It was her. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, I, I'm happy to answer questions, but I was really mainly just wanted to give you the introduction of what the bill was because there's a lot there. Yeah. Uh, but thank I'm happy you to so questions. much. Well, Julio, you're bobbing. Does that mean like you're thinking about raising your hand? No, I was nodding at getting the name correct about the other witness. Oh, okay, okay. What I, again, thank you, Representative. Um, what I need from all of us is a sense. So I sent the bill, a link to it. I'm trusting you've read it. I need feedback of some form on these issues to take two the Senate Judiciary on Thursday morning. So this is your chance to go. Yeah. I'm going to let me see if I can kick this off to some degree, because there were similar issues that have been up before us around related issues, I would say. Um, the term reasonable has been an issue for people on this body in other contexts. So I'm just going to throw that out there as bait and see if that is if that has a similar reaction in this context and if that might be something that I should be speaking about. So, uh, Eitan, this is Judge Grierson. I'm going to take the easy way out on this one. Um, I have not Certainly. testified. I have not testified on this bill for what probably are obvious reasons. It's purely a policy decision, and therefore, I would not be weighing in either with this group or with the, the committee. I don't believe that I have testified on uh, this bill for those reasons. So, I don't think I can be of much assistance to you tonight in, in that regard. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sorry. But... Anybody else? Yeah, I guess I'll talk. <laughs> well, please. So, um, so first of all, I just want to make, make a point. Like, I know I, there's not reactions on here like I'm used to in Zoom. So I just wanted to exhale because personally, this is actually a hard and triggering conversation, especially being a black person what's going on in our world so I just want to make that point as I have this conversation that it's not easy for me to actually sit in this meeting and to endure the conversations that we're having and to look at the information that we're receiving and it's a lot to take in and so I, I just wanted to acknowledge that in that space but what I wanted to say was um, looking at the more 
more bigger picture and the more systemic picture, the more upstream and really concerned about what the last person said. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing what you said was basically y'all are still operating under white supremacy culture of policies. And we're trying to figure out how to undo those, dismantle them, get rid of them, whatever. But the reality to it is, is that those still exist. And so I'm wondering how we can continue to operate in that container that people are very forthcoming and saying in this public meeting, yet we, I understand we have to sort of chip away at various different things in order sort of to dismantle or break down these systems. But at the same time, I'm feeling like we're either not going upstream enough or not getting down to the roots enough. And so I just wanna um, put back into the space about that white supremacy container that we're in that other people mentioned in this in this space and not just me and that there are actually policies or laws on the books um that actually are not humane and dignified in which these um bills are supposed to be supporting i um so i would love to um have that be brought into the conversation Aton. uh a I'm few ready. other a few other things i wanted to say was um it's one thing to make these policies, but it's another thing to actually implement them and then to hold people accountable. So I'm wondering about the implementation and I'm wondering about the unlearning the, as much as the learning that needs to happen is the unlearning. Um, so the unlearning of these tactics and these uses and the learning of maybe alternative ways and communication and things like that, like those two things going hand in hand. So I'm very interested about what specifically we, us, whoever, is working on this is really looking at to sort of replace that with if if that is the method of chokehold in which people have been trained and are naturally just a go-to then how are we unlearning the actually physical tactic and how are we learning something else to replace that that can show up in our bodies because that is a physical thing and i think it's like really serious i um so, so i really want to understand more about the implementation and of of this bill and what that would really what that would really look like and what that would mean and maybe even being um, a little bit more specific to give some um, direction in that. I also am concerned about the accountability because as I know this is a bill going in and then you figure things out as you go down the line to be successful after implementation there has to be accountability and I really am trying to understand the um, immunity or the union or whatever it is that police have and it's it's hard to have these conversations of putting policies in place when they're not they're implemented in a white supremacy container and, and then there's no mechanisms for actual accountability when those things happen so i'm i'm having trouble in the conversation because i want to see those things and and maybe that's another bill and maybe I'm jumping like into other things, but I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned for that. And the things that I'll say that I um, like is I'm very pleased to hear about um, people who might have of mental illness and being able to have appropriate accommodations. I'm very, very pleased with that. And I think that should be uplifted. I am very pleased with the, what I consider as the no bystander um kind of rule or law of like not letting your buddy choke your choke the person out because you're on the law enforcement too i think that's a really good rule of thumb and again i think that should be um, lifted up i agree with what you said Aton, about um about um the um reasonableness of things and the last thing i want to say that i'm really concerned about is a lot of what i read is all about interpretation and and just like lawyers and officers as well, um, interpret things in the moment of how they feel. And we know that there is implicit and explicit bias and we can set all these things up and still understand like, where is that interpretation and is there something more specific or concise so it's clearer around not having such a wide interpretation of all of these policies that we're creating that um, are actually can cause people's lives. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila. Representative Lalonde. Yeah, sorry. Representative Lalonde, you have sorry, your hand up. That. Sorry, Ma, I turned off my video instead of turning on, on my mic. Yeah. Uh, Sheila, that was awesome. And I really appreciated, uh, <laughs> really appreciate that input. But I just want to, a, a couple of things just uh, for clar clarification. 
Um, so this this bill or uh, or in this law establishes this statutory standard. Uh, the actually impl the implementation of this is occurring through the the policies that are being formed right now. With uh, DPS is really taking the lead to get a model statewide policy, and that's where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. That's really where the details uh, come in, and from that is also the training. Uh, as far as you know, the de-escalation is really going to be uh, an emphasis, how to address the situations where an individual does have an impairment. My understanding is those details are, are really sorted out in the, in the policies and then in the training that is done. Uh, so I just wanted to definitely flag that uh, uh, for you. So, so my, the other point is that perhaps RDAP should be also weighing in on that policy. Uh, it's not just the statutory standard, and I know that that's an ongoing project. Uh, probably Julio knows more about where that stands right now, uh, but certainly that's a place that, that you could weigh in uh, on that. One final point I just want to uh, note is that uh, the Criminal Justice Training Council has not trained on chokeholds for a very long time. Uh, it's not something that's going to be trained on. It's not something that has been trained on. Uh, but what we learned in testimony is there are situations where there's a grappling situation and and that's really, you know, it's it's uh, somebody, a law enforcement officer may use a chokehold uh, in, in, in those limited circumstances because there's no other there's no other action that can be taken. So in any event, I just wanted to comment and, and, and answer a couple of those questions, but I really do appreciate uh, Sheila, and hopefully we'll get you to testify at some point in front of uh, uh, the Judiciary Committee on some of the various issues. So thanks. Great. Anyone else? Julio. Yeah, just to follow up with what um, <clears throat> what Sheila was saying about um, I mean, covered a lot of really important ground. Uh, I think on some of this, uh, for folks who have not been involved in or following the legislative action, a lot of the things that the that the Vermont legislature did, it wasn't like it all just came out of, you know, the Golden Dome. Um, so, the, uh, for example, advocacy for raising the standard for use of force and, and, and until it's a last resort necessity is really, I think was the first uh, demand put out last June by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, they put out a list of police reform uh, priorities. Uh, so I just wanna uh, acknowledge that there've been a lot of invoice, uh, important voices nationally and locally um, who've been advocating these changes and, and um, it's been, a, I think in different states, it's a, been a collaborative efforts. LDF also put out uh, demands and uh, it's had some success in Vermont and, and in other states uh, uh, zeroing in on, on chokeholds and, and neck restraints. Um, so I just wanted to add that perspective that a lot of these ideas um, have genesis really from uh, a lot of the communities that have been most most affected. And so it's good to see that Vermont is picking up on them and there's a lot to do in policing. Um, and uh, I really do encourage people to, to follow it more closely because every time I've heard a new, a new witness testify, they've added really something important to the, the conversation. So I would, I would encourage it as much as I love hearing Aton, uh, I, I'd love to hear more people. Uh, I, I think you'd agree, right, Aton? Is that having the same five or ten? God, times? yes. So I think that I think that's it would be really important, and uh, I think uh, everybody's got got something to say. And you all should know I've been passing on names of a lot of you. <laughs> you should know that I've been sneaky, Rebecca. And to. Uh share with the panel. Um, of course, I'm here as the Defender General's designee, so to the extent that I can share what the Office of the Defender General's position has been on this bill, um, I, was, I was following this more closely last summer. 
we, we generally support this, but echoing what Sheila has said here, uh, we had some concerns um, similar to what you're you're talking about now, which is about uh, the interpretation of, of, of a lot of the terms referenced there. Uh, but what hasn't been raised here is there was a creation of a new crime, um, a 20 year felony. And again, we didn't think that was the best approach for this. I think the, the, the theme that Sheila's hitting upon that I want to just jump on, and it relates to what the Defender General's um, criticism has been, if there is, it's just that it's, it's too narrowly focused that we worry that it won't address um, sort of the systemic issue, uh, rather it's so focused on individual officers in a particular type of use of force instance, um, but in terms of dealing with real accountability, transparency, I know there was some discussion, I don't I haven't followed this, where the body cam uh, uh, aspect to this peeled off or if that's still alive, um, whether or not police disciplinary records were going to be made public. Uh, while there is some references in there in terms of addressing mental health uh, crises, we wanted to see actual uh, proposed legislation going deeper into addressing uh, uh, first responders um, to the scene of mental health crises. And in fact, rethinking entirely, not very far afield from what RDAP has discussed in our report um, and Susanna Davis has referenced here this morning, uh, earlier today. So I just wanted to share that, uh, Eitan, just um, for what it's worth. I got lost here. This is great. Thank you. This is great. Anybody else have, have, this is wonderful. Thank you. It's, I'm going to spend a lot of time uh, tomorrow crafting a good outline for what I will say. Um, does anyone hey, else have it? Yes, whoever just said my name. Oh, this is David Chair. Hi, David. Hi there. I just wanted to know, Julio Thompson's really been uh, our office's expert working on this bill, assisting the legislature with uh, drafting it and, and making sure the various details all work together. But did just want to know, and I appreciate his, his comments earlier, um, wanted to note for you, the chair, and for the record, our office has been broadly supportive of this bill and last year's sort of twin, if you will, or precursor effort around raising the standard. Um, just so you, we have, I, I don't want to like take up too much time here because we, we sort of get our own privileged voice in the legislature. Um, and so I want other panel members to spend more time speaking about it, but I just, just want to note, so you know, for the record, as a member, we are supportive of the, of the bill. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Representative Lalonde, thank you again. That was that was very helpful. Thanks for offering to do that. My pleasure. And um, I want to simply quickly in the few moments we have left, circle back to Coach Christie's comments about um, H317, the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics. I cannot say that. And um, the possibility of RDAP playing an advisory role um, in that body. Uh, I my suggestion is, I guess, frankly, that we look at that at our next meeting, because we're not really going to have time to delve, I think, at this point with five minutes left, more deeply into what it would take, if it's even possible, for this body to do that. We would, at least in my view, really, as I said earlier when Coach was speaking, um, need to talk very, very dramatically and concretely about administrative support for this panel. Um, I am, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for Olivia Voth. However, we will need more um, and a lot more, I think, 
Um, we currently meet twice, I mean, once a month. I'm not sure, and I don't know because I don't know what this is all going to take at this moment. I don't know that anyone does, but it would seem not beyond the realm of impossibility that we would need to be more in touch than we presently are. So in other words, there's there are just a lot of issues. I think they've been thrown very quickly at us. As Coach himself says, this is the beginning of a, of a discussion. Um, and I'm more than willing to outline some of this and circulate them to the panel for comments and get it going that way to sort of jumpstart a conversation for our meeting in May. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may. Co Representative. <laughs> um, believe it or not, I've got this really bizarre, it's called uh, X-Mind, and it's a mind mapping piece of software. And okay. I, uh, what I created is a scary map. <laughs> okay. But, but I think it might be helpful for you when you get a chance to look at it as your okay. friend questions because it it's actually um, fairly accurately detailed around the um, uh, the charge you know of our right the Great. Charges. and so so a lot of that's detailed and then the discussion pieces that you're talking about can be ongoing just to see what partners okay. would be available and willing to assist in developing the next stages. So um, th that's the an additional cliff note. Great. Thank you. Coach, I think you and I need to talk. I think you and I should get together and start working on this idea I have for the panel as a whole to sort of mm -hmm. outline issues mm -hmm. for a kind of like white paper that I can circulate to the panel. So people can comment on it and look at it and think about it and not rush. Does that sound all right that you and I get in touch about this? It, it sounds like a great plan. Great. Let's do that then. So um, in the one minute and 20 seconds we have left, does anyone have new business to raise? <laughs> Sheila. Sheila. Sorry, I couldn't get myself off of mute. Thank you, Eitan. You're welcome. Go ahead. Um, no, it's it's not new business. I just wanted to be clear with what our task was. And Director Susanna, I think, had said that one of the things that is being asked of the RDAP is actually where to, what is our pin, opinion on placing the Bureau of Statistics, where we want to house it. Is that correct? I just wanted to make sure, because I didn't really just hear that from you, and so I was a little confused. Uh, we are working on that, yes, but they that's already under discussion, but we're working on talking about it being housed partly under this body. That's something I didn't discuss in front of the legislature, and what I'm talking about is that there are a bunch of issues that would be involved, and starting a discussion on paper of what all those issues would be and having on that paper sort of a back and forth people put down concerns dislikes likes things of that nature so is it my understanding um i would like to understand and have more information of the different branches and where things can be placed. I'm hearing a lot of conversation, not just on this panel, but in different um, committees or panels that I'm sitting on and where we're constantly having these discussions of, of independency and people wanting to be really independent and then also talking about either support or actual placement of an entity within these branches. And I'd just be honest that I feel ignorant around what those branches really do and how they can really support what is going on. And I'd love if somebody has the cheat sheet to that, to provide that to the RDAP so that when we come back, before we come back next month, I can understand more about, well, why would I want it independent versus in the judicial 
or in the admin or whatever. And I just don't quite understand it. I don't know if that information is compiled in one place. And I think it'd be really helpful for me and as well as my community to um, have that resource. Let me try digging around. That's going to be interesting. I'll try digging around, Sheila. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay. Our next meeting is 11 May 2021. Uh, just so you know, obviously there are going to be a bunch of emails going around before then. Um, and if anyone wants to entertain a motion to adjourn. Actually, it's not entertain if one wants to float it. I move to adjourn, Sheila. Thank you. Does anyone second that? Julie, I second. Grand. All in favor, unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Everyone opposed, unmute yourself. Everyone oh, abstaining. You know what? We won. We're done. I will see you all next month. Thank you very, very much for everyone's attention and participation. Susanna, Coach Christie, Representative Lalonde, all of the folks from CRG. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your work and participation. And everyone, have a good month. Get your shots and I'll see you in May. Be well. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.